what a privilege is mine to be with you this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever you are watching, as we're going to study the subject which I've entitled Fireproof. And I just pray that God will bless you in your homes, wherever you are, that your families and yourself, you'll have a closer walk with Jesus. Let us pray before we begin. Father in heaven, we thank you that we have this opportunity to study your word, especially in light of what's taking place around us in the world and end time events. I pray for the special outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon us as your children as we consider the subject today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, it's been almost a month now on lockdown and I know it's really difficult for many of us, um, for most of us, if not all of us. Uh, some of us are getting used to working from home and others, we just can't wait to get back on the road like myself and uh, do what uh, you are accustomed to doing. But I believe that life is not going to be the same as it was before and I'm sure most of you realize what's happening globally. But I believe that God has a message for us in these end times that uh, will encourage us and will help us to even become more connected with Him, more faithful, and not just survive but thrive. And so we're going to study uh, something that perhaps you've looked at before, heard messages on before, studied before, but it has to do with this word that we're going to see time and time coming through our subject and study today and it's a word that Moses asked and I want you to turn with me in your Bibles if you have it if not it's going to be on the screen of course and notice what Moses says here to God this is in Exodus 33 and verses 18 and I want you to understand the setting of where Moses is right now Moses has come down from the mountain he had been up in the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments and of course, you know the story when he came down with Joshua, uh, they found that uh, there was some noise in the camp and there was uh, idolatry taking place while he was up receiving the Ten Commandments. Here was Aaron and the children of Israel actually making and then worshipping a golden calf. Of course, you know, Moses in his righteous indignation throws down the Ten Commandments on the two tablets of stone and of course they shatter into so many pieces it was the experience of God's people failing him uh, they had said when Moses had told them what God required of them and we find that in Psalm uh, in Exodus chapter 19 they heard what God said about the commandments and they said all the Lord has said we will do and just a few days later they had broken their covenant with God and so now this is the second time uh, that the commandments are going to be written. Uh, the first time as you, as you read the account, uh, that God wrote them on tablets of stone and gave them to Moses. And now he's actually asking Moses, you know, get an another set of tablets, come up and I will write again as it was on the first set. But I want you to see what Moses asked of God because God wanted to get rid of the children of Israel. And uh, God was so disappointed in how they had so quickly broken the covenant they had made with him. As he had spoken the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai and all that glory and splendor. And uh, here now God says to Moses, listen, I'm going to make a new lot of people. Let's get rid of this uh, rebellious and stiff-necked people. And this is where Moses shows what a type of Christ he was. And he says, Lord, if you're going to get rid of them, well, then, you know, uh, you might as well wipe me out of your book. But then he pleads with God and says, you know, the children of Israel have come out of Egypt with a mighty hand. What are the nations going to say if now you just going to wipe them out? Of course, God was testing Moses here. God had a love and a grace for his people. Anyhow, uh, God says to Moses, okay, I'm going to lead you with the children of Israel. And then Moses asks this question here. He says, Lord, show me your glory. Show me your glory. And so... Here is what God says uh, to Moses, Exodus 33 verses 20. 
But he said, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. This is the experience of sin. We are separated from God and we have no face-to-face -face communion as Adam and Eve had before the fall. And so here, although they had seen the splendor and glory on top of Mount Sinai, God says to Moses, listen, I cannot see you face to face or else you will not live. But notice what God says to Moses. He says to him, and the Lord said, here is a place by me and you shall stand in the rock. Uh, Exodus 33 verse 21. So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. So notice what God says to Moses is, then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face you cannot see or else Moses, you'll be destroyed by the glory of my personality. So notice what happens then we find here in Exodus 34, this is what happens. And so then Moses rose early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. So this is the second set because the first had been broken as he came down. Here is Moses making his way up in the mountain. And so notice what happens after this. It says, Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the law, the name of the Lord. So, so, so here God is still veiling himself in a cloud and he comes to Moses. Moses had asked the question, remember, Lord, show me your glory. And here, what does God do? He proclaims the name of the Lord. So God's glory, we're going to find out his character is found in his name and in the person of who God is. And I want you to notice what God's name stands for. It says, and the Lord, this is the Lord Jehovah, and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and in truth. And so here Moses recognizes that this is who God is. It's all about his person and it's all found in his character and his name. His name is that which proclaims his glory, his character and his love. I want you to notice here in Deuteronomy what it says here. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 24. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire and so here is God he comes down on Mount Sinai you can read the account that the, the, the mount itself was on fire and the glory of God and his voice came and proclaimed the Ten Commandments and there was lightning and thunder and the mountain shook and the children of Israel were so afraid they said to Moses please don't let God speak to us just you speak with God and bring the message. And so here Moses records because of his experience with God that God is a consuming fire. You see, God's grace and God's love wants to be wrapped up in your and my person. He wants to consume the most thing that he hates, that's our sin. And he wants to preserve you and me so that our characters might shine with the glory of God. Notice here, uh, explaining here from the book of Ezekiel, God's throne and God's glory that surrounds his throne. It says in Ezekiel 20 verses 14, you are the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You are on the holy mountain of God. Of course, this is referring to Lucifer before his fall. But here, notice what it says here. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. So Lucifer who was one of the covering cherubs. And there are two. He walked between the stones that were on fire. God's throne is a throne of fire. Ezekiel sees this here. And he falls down in awe and worships. 
Isaiah also has a vision, an epiphany of God in Isaiah chapter 6. And he sees the temple of God that in his temple is filled with his glory. Of course, we find that Moses approached a burning fiery bush before the children of Israel were set free from Egypt. And God told him, take off the shoes or your sandals off your feet because the ground in which you stand on is holy. Of course, we find that uh, the three Hebrew boys, they go through a fiery furnace and God is with them. So here is God's throne pictured in a fiery midst of stones. I want you to notice what uh, Ezekiel goes on to say here in verses 16. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed your covering cherub from the midst of the fiery stones. And so God's throne, Ezekiel sees it as, uh, bay, uh, as standing on sapphire stones. Uh, Moses also sees it on sapphire stones. We find here God's throne is about who he is. I want you to see what Isaiah has to say here in Isaiah 14 verses 13. Speaking about the same thing that Ezekiel has just spoken about. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit in the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. And so here's God's throne, God's mount. It's in the north. And we find that the stars, it's God's angels are there to worship him and to give him glory but this one angel lucifer he wanted to take the place of god himself notice what it says of him here i will ascend above the heights of the clouds i will be like the most high so lucifer he wanted to take over the position of god himself he ascribed he was envious and he was so determined to take the throne of God that he got a third of the angels in heaven to side with him in that rebellion. Of course, we see that in Revelation chapter 12. But this is what took place in heaven. Lucifer, whose love was self-centered, wanted to take the place of God, whose love is selfless, whose love reaches outward and seeks to win the hearts of all his creation. This one creature, he rebelled against God's love. And we find that God now sends his son Jesus to come to this earth to reveal what his love, what his character is all about. And notice what it says about God here. First John chapter 4 and verses 8. I'm sure it's a text you know so well. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is love. That's the character of God here. Therefore, love, Paul says in the book of Romans 13 verses 10, is the fulfillment of the law. So here's Moses who had gone up to the mount to receive God's law. And it's a transcript, as we will see, of his character, which is love. And so Paul says, therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So no wonder Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verses 15, if you love me, then keep my commandments. Wow. I want you to look at this quote here from Selected Messages, book 1, on page 240, paragraph 3. It says, God requires perfection of his children. His law is the glory of Christ, which is revealed in the law, which is a transcript of his character. And his transforming efficacy is felt upon the soul until men become changed into his likeness. And so we're talking about fireproof, fireproof characters. They are made partake of the divine nature and grow more and more like the Savior, advancing step by step in conformity to the will of God till they reach perfection. This is what God is able to do in your life and my life. But we need to be willing to cooperate with God's work. Of transforming us and this is done by the Holy Spirit notice what it says here in Acts of the Apostles uh, page 482 verses uh, uh, paragraph 3 it says the divine spirit works to the powers and faculties given to men of ourselves we are not able to bring the purposes and desires and inclinations into harmony with the will of God but here's the contradistinction but if we are willing to be made willing the Savior will accomplish this for us. And so all God wants the willing heart. 
We don't have the ability to change and transform our characters. We are sinful beings and we have sinful thoughts and we do sinful deeds. But here is God's willingness to transform us if you and I are willing to be made willing. So we need to pray and say, God, help me to be willing to be made willing. So there was another who had self-centered love. He had been taught and shown through Daniel's understanding of prophecy in Daniel chapter 2 that God is sovereign. God rules in the heavens and he sets up kings and kingdoms and he is the one that is the God who is in charge of all that takes place. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar, he wanted to, uh, he ascribed to take the place of God just as Lucifer did. So notice here in Daniel 3 verses 1, we're not going to look at the whole story, we're just going to look at the highlights. Nebuchadnezzar the king. So here is King Nebuchadnezzar. He had received a message from Daniel. He had recognized after seeing that message that through the dream that he failed to remember. And when Daniel gives him the dream and its interpretation, he exclaims, there's no God like this God. And for a time he has a partial conversion. But somehow a few years later, he's in his palace and he decides as well, you know what? I want to change that image that had four different metals, remember? Gold, silver, bronze, and then iron, and then feet of iron and clay. He says, I want it to be all gold because the head, of course, symbolized him, as Daniel told him. You, O king, are the head of gold. And so he makes an image. Notice what it says here in, verses, um, in Daniel chapter 3, verses 1, the latter part. So Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits. And it's worth six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So what happens here? It says, And all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So here's the inauguration of this image. It was an image actually of himself. He saw himself as God now. And so he makes an image all of gold. And it says, And they stood before the image Nebuchadnezzar has set up. We're going to discover that in the last days, the time in which you and I are living soon, another image is going to be set up and it is going to be the anti-type of what happened here in Babylon some almost 2,500 years ago. So it says at the time that when all the people heard the sound of all the kinds of music, all the people, nations and languages, you can see this is a, a decree that affects the entire world fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And so we find here is someone who sets up his own authority. He sets up an image and he requires worship. We're going to discover that's exactly what happens in the book of Revelation chapter 13. There's this power called the beast. He's going to set up an image as well and he's going to require all to worship this image of the beast. And therein lies the mark of the beast. And so notice what happens here. As they played, of course, the music, you know the story, there were three who did not bow down. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Michigan, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid you any regard. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Of course, the king knew these men very well. They were part of his cabinet. These were Daniel's friends. Daniel this time was not here. But these were very important men that he looked up to for counsel in the affairs of Babylon. And so when they brought to him, they try, he tried to give them a second chance. But their minds were made up. You see, they had not even taken of the wine of Babylon. So they were not going to be induced, deceived into its worship from the very beginning. And so they were true worshippers of God. God is going to have a people who are true worshippers in the end time. That will not be deceived by the wine of Babylon. That will not bow down. That will not bend to the image or the mark of the beast. And so notice what Nebuchadnezzar tells him. Listen, if you're not going to obey me, notice what he says here. Then Nebuchadnezzar in rage and fury gave the command to bring Shadrach, Mishkan, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. They answered, they said, listen, we will not bow. We will not bend to your image. We are true worshippers of the God. And then they tell the king, listen, king, we are ready to die if, it need, if need be. But if not, let it be known to your king that we will not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. So what takes place here? 
is an end time scenario, friends, because God is going to do exactly that for you and I who will come against the fury of the beast, his image, and the mark that he wants to impose upon all. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury and the expression of his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Before he tried to uh, parley with them, before he tried to induce them, before he tried to even compliment them and say, listen guys, you know, you are important. I need you in my kingdom. But listen, you're going to embarrass me in front of them. Just, just bow down and everything will be okay. But they would not. And so he spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace. How many times? Seven times hotter. Seven times hotter than it was usually to be heated. In fact, it was so hot that it destroyed the soldiers who, were, who cast Dan, Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the furnace. Of course, we know them by their Hebrew names, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. And so they were thrown into this burning, fiery furnace. And so notice what took, split, what took place now. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound in the fiery furnace? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Notice what his reply was now. Look, he answered, I see not three, but four men, and they are loose, and they are walking up and down in the fire. Remember God's throne in heaven? That Lucifer used to walk, one of the covering cherubs, up and down in the midst of the fire. Here is God, through Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Son of God. He comes down and he's in the fire with these three young men. And so God delivers them through that ordeal. I want you to be encouraged by this message that yes, we're going to face trials. Yes, God is allow us to go through the fire. Yes, it's going to be difficult. And even now, God is preparing us for that time. But God is going to be with us. God is going to be with us. So let's go to the book of Revelation and see what uh, is going to happen in this end time scenario that is right ahead of us. This is still future. But I want you to know, God is giving us this to prepare. Revelation 13 verses 15. And he was granted to give breath to the image of the beast. So this is the lamb-like beast that makes an image to the first beast, which of course we understand as we study it to be the papacy, the Roman state church. So here is another power, the United States, that has power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So here is a power in the end times. The Bible says that this power will also command worship. The central issue in Revelation 13 is worship and this power is willing to use force as we saw King Nebuchadnezzar use force that as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And so this power will have a tremendous following behind it. The kings of this earth will be behind this power and great men and rich men and mighty men will be behind this power. But I want you to know that God is going to be behind His people even though they are going to be brought into straight and difficult places. Notice what it goes on to say in verse 16. He, this power that, has going to, that is going to be given authority with the beast. This is pros, Protestant America that has fallen through the wine of Babylon. He causes all, both great and small, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark in their right hand or on their foreheads. And so here is something that takes place here. God is showing you and I that the time is coming when men will be forced into worship, either through your hand, which is a symbol of your works. You go along, you consent, even though intellectually you don't agree with it. But because you want to save your business, your job, you want to save your skin, you want to be able to buy and sell, you're just going to go along. But there are those who will have the name of the beast, the number of the beast, the mark of the beast in their foreheads, which is of course your prefrontal cortex, where we make decisions, where our conscience is, where we are spiritual and make spiritual decisions. It says that nobody will be able to buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So we see a people who have a name. 
the name of the beast. So I want you to notice, even though we're going to go through a time of trouble and it's going to be trying for God's people, God will not forget his people as he did not forget the three Hebrew boys, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. I'm quoting here from the book, Great Controversy, here, page 626, paragraph 3. Will the Lord forget his people in this trying hour when the time of trouble comes? Did he forget Lot when the fire came down from heaven to consume the cities of the plain? Did he forget Joseph surrounded by idolaters in Egypt? Did he forget Elijah when the oath of Jezebel threatened him with the fate of the prophets of Baal? Did he forget the three Hebrew worthies? We've just looked at the experience in the fire and furnace or Daniel in the lion's den. No, God does not abandon his people and some may sleep the sleep of death. But theirs is going to be a wonderful resurrection when Jesus comes with new bodies. Again, I'm quoting from this book, Great Controversy, page 621, paragraph 2. God will send his angels to comfort and protect them in the time of peril or the time of trouble. The assaults of Satan are fierce and determined. His delusions are terrible, but the Lord says, the Lord's eye, rather, is upon his people. And his ear listens to their cries. The affliction is great. The flames of the furnace seem about to consume them, but the refiner will bring them forth as gold tried in the fire. Did he bring forth Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael out of the fire, refined? Absolutely. Their characters were fireproof because they had learned to trust God with all their heart and all their might and all the soul. Notice again what it says here in the latter paragraph. It says, God's love for his children during the period of this severest trial is as strong and tender as in the days of their sunniest prosperity. But it is needful. What is that word? Needful for them to be placed in the furnace of fire. Their earthliness must be consumed that the image of Christ may be perfectly reflected in them. God's glory will finally be perfectly reflected in those who will stand during the time of trouble. And it says, only those whose minds are fortified with the word of God, only those who have the power of the Holy Spirit that works and lives in them will be able to stand because the Holy Spirit will seal us. While everyone is sealed with the mark of the beast, God seals his children, his faithful children, and they are ready to go through the time of trouble. And none of them are lost because they are sealed with the Spirit of God. So what's it for us today? Notice what it says here in paragraph 3 of 621 of the same book. The period of probation, which is now, friends, my brothers and sisters, this time in which we are living... God is giving you and I probation. And what is it for? It's granted to all to prepare for that time. That's the time of trouble. Jacob prevailed because he was persevering and determined. His victory is an evidence of the power of importunate prayer. All who will lay hold of God's promises as he did and be as earnest and persevering as he was will succeed as he succeeded. So, friends, God has promised that he'll be with us and all of the promises of God are yes in him and in him. Amen to the glory of God through us. And so we can claim these promises, but we need to know them for ourselves now so that when this time comes, we have an abiding faith that will stand. It says here, the Lord permits great controversy, page 633, paragraph one, the Lord permits conflicts to prepare the soul for peace. The time of trouble is a fearful ordeal for God's people, but it is the time for every true believer to look up and by faith he may see the bow of promise encircling the sapphire throne. God's love for you and me will burn even brighter when we face tumultuous times, when we go through perilous times, when we go through the time of trouble. Paul speaks about this time of trouble to, to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He says, perilous time shall come. Uh, people will become lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. They'll be traitors, they'll be heady. They will be so full of themselves, self-centered love. And some of them will have a, a, a form of godliness, but they'll deny the power of God. And so, Isaiah has this to say, this is God's promise to you and I. Can a woman forget a sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of a womb? 
And the answer is yes. There are many women that abort their children. There are many women that abandon their children, young and old. Many go against their children. But notice what God says. Yea, they may forget, yet I will not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee in the palms, upon the palms of my hands. Jesus' self-sacrificing love for you and I. His unselfish love that reached down from Calvary to you and to me today is still available. He says, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. The Great Controversy, page 627, verses 1. I encourage you to read this book, especially the end time, uh, the time of trouble and the end time there. It's really pertinent for you and I today. Though the enemies may thrust them into prison, yet dungeon walls cannot cut off the communication between their souls and Christ. One who sees their every weakness, who is acquainted with every trial, is above all earthly powers. And angels will come to them in lonely cells, bringing light and peace from heaven. So where God is, that's where there's peace. That's where heaven is. And even though we may find ourselves uh, in a cell, in prison, in a dungeon, we may find ourselves incarcerated and put in isolation, in solitary confinement as John was on the island of Patmos. That's where Jesus came and met with him. And so angels will come and bring encouragement from heaven for those who are facing the wrath of the beast and his image and those who have sided with him. Notice what it says here, Psalm 91. This is a beautiful psalm. It, it, re, it refers to how God is going to protect his people when the seven last plagues are poured out, poured out on this world and the time of trouble such as never was before will take place. It says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him, I will trust. Trust, friends, is a relationship. Trust is faith in God, faith in His Word, faith in His power to deliver you and me. And this is the time we ought to encourage and uh, cement that kind of faith. Surely He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. And even now as this COVID-19 is going all over the world as a pestilence, God is able to protect you and me. It's not the time of trouble. But God has given you and I a time to prepare for what surely is going to come. Because when the time of trouble does come, it is going to separate the moss from the dross, the wheat from the tares. The church right now has got wheat and tares. We don't know who they are, but God knows the heart. But when trouble comes, it will sift the church of all the nominal Christians, those who have a surface relationship. And only those who have a true heart for God, His love, His law, and His will, those who are sealed by the Holy Spirit, they will have the seal of the living God. So two classes only, the saved, the lost, those who have the seal of God, those who have the mark of the beast, that's all there will be. That time is right ahead of us. Notice what John sees as the time of trouble comes to an end. Notice who is the group that is victorious. Revelation chapter 14, this is where we find the three angels' messages. But before we come to the three angels' messages, God is showing you and I what the end result will be for all those who love and obey Him. He sees them already having obtained victory. Notice what He says, And I looked and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with Him 144,000, having His Father's name written where? On their foreheads, in their mind, they have chosen to follow God. You see, when Jacob chose completely to follow God and persevered with him there on the other side of the river Jabbok, his name was changed from Jacob the supplanter, the deceiver, to Israel, a prince with God. And so his name was changed, signifying a change of character. And so here are people whose characters are now fireproof, whose characters are changed by the transforming power of God's word through the Holy Spirit. And they have his father's name in their heads. And so those who follow the beast, his mark, his image, those who follow the wine of Babylon are deceived. As Jesus said in Matthew 24, in the last days, the end time before he comes, the most serious thing the church will face, and that message was to the church, not to the world, to the church, is deception. Deception. God said three times, take it that no man deceive you. Many will come in my name and deceive many. And he says, if it were possible, they will even deceive the very elect, Matthew 24, 24. And so here are people whose father's name, whose character, 
is written on their foreheads, they are transformed into the image of God. And in their mouth, it says, was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. I'm looking for that time. Oh, how about you? Notice what it goes on to say here in Revelation 15 verses 2. Notice again, uh, the apostle John, John the Revelator, is writing this, showing what happens in the end after this controversy is over who are the winners again it says here in revelation 15 verses 2 just before the plagues fall but it's telling you what happens even after the plagues fall and so revelation goes backwards and forwards backwards and forwards and so you need to understand the context but here notice what it says here i saw something like a sea of glass mingled with what fire Fire, God is a consuming fire, but God wants you and me to have characters that are so changed and transformed by his word. And that's why fire came down on the disciples on the day of Pentecost. They, they went about preaching the word of God and their characters, their lives were changed. And so here are God's people now. They are standing where? On the sea of glass, mingled with fire. And those have the victory over what? The beast over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name. Complete, total victory over the system of Babylon, which is fallen and will finally fall forever. See, the plagues fall upon those who have the mark of the beast. You can read about it there in Revelation 16. And so, friends, I want you to understand here. Here are God's people. They stand in the sea of glass. They have harps of God. And they sing the song of who? Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of saints. And so they've endured the time of trouble. And now they are victoriously standing with God. But notice they give God glory. They give God the honor. They ascribe to Him as the mighty and almighty God and the King of saints. Who ought to be worshipped alone? And says here, who shall stand? Verses 4, who shall, who shall not fear you rather? O oh, oh Lord, and what? Glorify your name. This will be the end time people that will stand victorious with God. They will bring glory to God. For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments have been manifested and so i want you to know that we are living in the very last days for sure you see jesus spoke of what would take place when the disciples asked him matthew 24 when shall these things be what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the age because jesus predicted the fall of the city of jerusalem and the destruction of the temple well jesus said in in in, in matthew 24 15 when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by daniel the prophet stand in the holy place then let him who reads understand. Well, if you want to understand the text, you go to Luke. Luke chapter 21 is speaking of the same event. It's just Luke's way of putting it, which is the same for Matthew 24, 15, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Dan the prophet. But notice what he says here. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, the armies of pagan Rome that came to destroy the city, then know that its desolation is near. And notice what he says here. Then those who are in Judea, let, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. They were to flee for safety. And when they flee, they flee to a place called Pella, the other side of Jordan. Well, here God says, Ellen White says in the book Desire of Ages, that this chapter, Matthew 24 and Luke 21, has got a dual application. It was for the disciples during the time of Christ. And also for those who are living in the end of time. And so when the decree goes forth to destroy God's people, it's time for God's people to leave the cities. There's going to be a little time of trouble that will alert people to know that it's time to leave the cities. And it's about happening now. And so we need to be praying earnestly. We need to be asking God to show us what to do. So the disciples who heeded the prophecy of Jesus, they fled to Pella. And from Pella, many, 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 many missions were sent out by the church. 
In fact, there's a picture of Pele Bevan. I have been there. It was quite serene to be there because you understood this is where God had ascension for his people. And though they were facing difficult times, God was able to lead them. Of course, those who remained in Jerusalem, when Titus came back, after the failed uh, blockade by Cestius, this time the city was destroyed. And of course, we know Ellen White says, and so does Josephus say, more than a million Jews perished and the rest of them were sent into captivity. And so notice what Corinthians says here, 2 Corinthians 3 verses 18. But we all, all of us, if you, if I want to be transformed, if I want to have a fireproof character, then I need to behold Jesus every day in my life. It says, but we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory, the glory, God's character, God's love of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. That's going to be our experience. You don't get it all one time. It's an advance in your character transformation if you and I will be willing to be made willing to cooperate with God's Spirit just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So it's God's Spirit that transforms our characters. God gives us His love. The Spirit equips us and gives us the fruit of the Spirit. So you can understand why Paul uh, says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it what? All to the glory of of God. Do you want to have a character that's fireproof? A God that brings, a, a, a character that brings glory to God? I do. Notice this promise here in Maranatha, uh, page 112, paragraph 6. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of his church. When the character of the Savior shall be perfectly rep reproduced in his people, he will come to claim them as his own. The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service and its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. From the beginning, it has been God's plan through his church shall be reflected to the world, his fullness and his sufficiency. The final and full display of the love of God, God's character. I'm about to close now. Notice what it says here. I've just got three more slides. The great controversy is ended. It's the last chapter, the last page. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness through the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world. All things animate and inanimate. In the unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare what everyone? That God is love. That's what God's will for you and I, friends. Love was there in the beginning, before sin, with Adam and Eve in the first chapter, two chapters of Genesis. And the last two chapters of Revelation show God again in a loving relationship with His people. In between those two chapters of Revelation and Genesis 1 and 2 and Revelation 21 and 22 is God pursuing His people, wanting to have a relation with them and to bring them into a loving and peaceful re revelation of His will. And so, as I close, John 14, 27, God wants you and I to have peace. Don't be troubled. It's a wonderful chapter. You can read that chapter, John 14. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So God wants you and I, even in this time of lockdown, even this time of un certainty and insecurity some don't even know if they still have their jobs some have already lost their jobs businesses will close there'll be a lot of economic hardships but god is with you and me god wants you and i to recognize he's in control he's on the throne the earth is the lord the fullness thereof and the world and all that dwell in it he sits on the throne the heavens is his throne and this earth is his footstool and god will take care of you and me and finally god will save you the last verses in the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, verses 20, it says, He who testifies these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And I pray that you and I will be ready to meet the Lord. Some of us will be sleeping like Auntie Edna that just gone to sleep. And will come up in the first resurrection. As for me, I have said to the Lord, 
If you want me to sleep, that's fine, Lord, as long as I die in you and come up in the first resurrection. If I'm to live during the time of trouble, then I and you, if we are going to make it, we need to have a faith that will endure. We need to pray with so much power like we've never had. We need to hold on to God as Jacob held on to God. We need to be faithful to God. We need to take his word and we need to be willing to share those truths. So that when Jesus comes, we might be ready. Is that your desire? I hope and pray that is your desire. If that's so, I would like to pray with you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you will be with us even through our difficult moments. Lord, you've promised that in the time of trouble, you will not forsake your people. You never will. You will be with them and you will deliver them. Michael will stand at the end. And during the time of great trouble, everyone will be delivered that are written in the book. Thank you for my brothers and sisters. I pray that you will bless them. Bless me, Lord, that I'll be faithful to you until you come in the clouds of heaven. With all the angels in power and great glory. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we will be with our loved ones again, never to part. And we will have immortal bodies. We will be with you. We will stand on the sea of glass, mingled with fire. We will sing the song of Moses and the Lamb, the song of our deliverance from sin. I pray that we may have characters that are transformed by your spirit, by your word, and that we will be able to stand amongst the fire. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all and have a happy Sabbath. Thank you.